in Burkina Faso, with the support of NEPAD, we came up with the IVM platform, which is a platform bringing, across, bringing together all sectors, uh, allowing policymakers, uh, parliamentarians, researchers, uh, developers to meet and discuss about various issues, to share information, scientific knowledge, and see what are the gaps in the regulatory framework to be filled in order to move forward with the technologies. We have a lot of implications at the regulatory level. Uh, if you want to come up with a tool, uh, we, we need to look at the various provisions of the health code and several other things. So these are issues that require a lot of sensitization and bringing together people and talk to them about talking to them about information across all the stakeholders. Uh, people uh, need to be prepared. We have technology that is coming up. What does our law say? What our legal what do our legal texts provide for? Uh, given that this is an urgent, that this are a, a, a tool or an innovation that is regulated do we have a text legal text that takes into account that nature of uh, health products so these are the issues that we need to to really uh, uh, sit on and get to discuss so that people get to know what we are talking about this is what needs to be done thank you thank you very much uh, i think he, uh, very important uh, sorry that we we went out of it in the time uh, but colleagues this is the process one is just to inform each other that you are not alone in this. There are so many other places that you can actually uh, get support uh, into this. I mean, support is of vast nature. Um, we have got so many NGOs, as well as the, um, um, you know, even in your own setup, there are so many of these science, uh, you know, sort of like commissions, uh, you know, departments, ministries, uh, that actually playing around with this information, which actually should be feeding into the what into the impact sectors, be it health, agriculture, and whatever whatever it is. Uh, I think he, you know that's one thing for sure. You're not uh, you're not, you're, you're, you're not alone. Tap on some of these sources, and let's see how far uh, we can go. So uh, once again, thank you very much to uh, you know the colleagues of dealt with the life sciences they know just this morning. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. And by the way, if I were to do a little bit of uh, marketing, uh, AFIDEP runs what is called the, a health technology platform, where actually most of these technologies they are talking about here, they are, they, they, the problem is there, very simplified. So, you know, I mean, uh, there are so many structured instruments to support you on this. And by the way, uh, there's a whole document that's going to come up, you know, uh, on whatever has been discussed here, uh, which basically ADN, but and AFIDEP are also going to publish again, very simplified language that basically uh, should be understood by those who are not necessarily experts in those areas. At this point, it's time to go for tea and coffee and health break. Uh, we will reconvene at the half past, uh, uh, half past 11. Thank you very much.
All right, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's not afternoon yet. So welcome back from a uh, health break. Health break is really important. <laughs> Gives us the break from, you know, the intellectual uh, discussions. So we had a really uh, brilliant uh, presentations and engagements both uh, yesterday and this morning, and we're going to continue with it. So uh, we had started with the biological technologies uh application of these uh, within the health sector so at this point in time we're going to have a presentation from dr gloria megache on the application of emerging technologies in maternal neonatal and uh, child health and uh, with this as a priority area in healthcare delivery systems uh in talking about this what comes to my mind is a discussion we had on this uh, during the regional dialogue in uh, Lilongwe. And uh, during a panel discussion, I remember Mama Africa, uh, that's uh, Professor Juliana Mafuel, talking about emerging technologies. And uh, she used uh, the light as an example. So uh, I believe she started off as a, a midwife before uh, moving on to do uh, something else in, uh, I believe, political economy. And so what she had said was that during the time uh, that she worked as a midwife, they started off with the lamp that uh, we find uh, in our villages, the one that I think it could be in a can, a small Milo can, and then with uh, something uh, coming out of it. So that is what they lighted and used during childbirth in the villages. They can't light with just that and sticking in the model. And then that uh, evolved into the lantern. So they started using uh, the lantern for uh, deliveries. And from the lantern, they went to uh, torch lights. And then from torch lights to chargeable lamps, uh, interchanging that with a torchlight. So she used that as an example of emerging technologies and went on further to talk about the impact that that uh, had on child delivery. And she actually asked us to imagine trying to uh, assist a woman to deliver with that light and the dangers that were involved, the babies that were lost as a, uh, during the process, the women that lost their lives uh, during the process. Now, thankfully, we have uh, electricity, but one also wonders um, how many um, hospitals, clinics, households in the rural areas have access to this. We also have uh, other emerging technologies that are being uh, utilized not by all, but by those who are, uh, have access to it. So this morning we would uh, explore further and uh, really uh, gain insight and have some discussions on it. So with um, this uh, brief intro, I'll hand um, you over now to Dr. Gloria Megache. Thank you. Right, thank you very much and good morning. Um, so my name is Gloria Megache, and my talk is on emerging technologies in maternal, neonatal, and child health. We're specifically looking at the role of genomic medicine, biospecimen, as well as biobank in Africa's healthcare systems. So I want us to look at some few highlights that we want to talk about. Is it on? Okay. Right, I think it went too far. Back, 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 back. Oh, come on, I'm rather going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yes, yeah. Okay, right. So some few highlights. Looking at the importance of emerging technology in maternal and neonatal child health care delivery. We'd also want to touch on the applications of technology-driven solutions. Looking at genomic medicine, biospecimen, and biobanks in maternal, neonatal, and child health. And also looking at the current implementation examples from African countries 
and then also look at challenges that are being faced and the opportunities in implementing these technologies. And then we'll look at some few case studies and success stories. Right. So we know that the world is focusing on, you know, improving excellence in public health and maternal, neonatal and child health remains a critical priority, especially in Africa. Why? Because maternal and neonatal, you know, um, health has, you know, um, dispar um, disparities that do exist. And in view of that, there are certain, you know, key statistics that would want to look at. It is too quick, right? So maternal mortality ratio is about 542 per 100,000 live births in sub-Saharan African countries. And this was reported last year by WHO. And then for neonatal mortality, we have 27 deaths per 100 or 1,000 live births. And then for under five children, we have 74 per 100 live births. And only 60% of births are being attended by skilled health personnel. So this is very, you know, alarming that need, you know, care needs to be taken to really address this. I think it's frozen. Right, so we're looking at some socioeconomic factors that impact on maternal, neonatal, and child health in Africa. So these factors significantly, you know, impact on maternal, newborn, and child health in Africa. And this negative impact of these factors outweighs you know the positive factors and we want to look at some of these and the first one to talk about is poverty right so poverty gives you know limited access to health care often limiting the access to essential health care services this include antenatal care skilled bed attendance as well as postnatal care for malnutrition poverty can lead to malnutrition which weakens the immune system as well as increasing risks of infections and diseases. And for delayed healthcare seeking, financial constraints, right, can also delay seeking medical attention that lead to worsened health conditions. We also look at geographic location and infrastructure. So the rural urban disparities also, you know, play a key role in affecting, you know, or having the socioeconomic factors on maternal and neonatal child healthcare. So rural areas often have limited access to healthcare facilities where skilled, you know, health workers are limited and also, you know, getting the essential medical supplies are not readily available. Poor infrastructure, poor transportation infrastructure hinders access to healthcare services, especially in remote areas. And then cultural norms, traditional bed practices, harmful traditional bed practices, as well as home bed without any skilled attendance, right, can also increase these risks of maternal and child mortality. So all these that have been stated do have impact on these you know, uh, maternal, child, and new needs. So for maternal mortality, poverty, lack of education, rural you know, um, residents increase you know, their risks. And for newborn mortality, obviously low birth weight, premature birth are linked to poverty and poor nutrition. And for child mortality, malnutrition, lack of immunization as well as poor health access can also contribute to these, you know, having you know, impact on mothers and children. So some of these challenges that we've talked about will obviously lead to limited healthcare infrastructure and resources. There's insufficient specialized healthcare providers, um, geographic barriers to assessing care. There's also inadequate diagnostic capabilities high prevalence of preventable implications or complications, and also limited, you know, capacity for early risk detection. So all these, right, need the integration of emerging technologies such as technology-driven solutions, genomic medicine, biospecimen and biobanks that will present an innovative solution to transform maternal, neonatal, child health care delivery across African health systems. So how are these integrated into giving, you know, better, you know, treatment or better care for mothers and children? So looking at some of these, you know, integration in improving, you know, health interventions for mothers and children, um, antenatal care, obviously regular checkups to monitor the, um, the mother's health, 
And then also you having skilled bed attendants that will ensure that the bed are being attended by skilled you know, health professionals. And also after you know, they've given bed, they need care to mothers and children in immediate postpartum period so that you know, the mother knows exactly what to do with herself and the newborn baby. Likewise, for child health, you provide the essential child health services such as immunization to the kid, and then family planning so that you don't just, you know, immediately after birth, you give birth again. There should be some space in between all that, right? So giving the right plan, you know, family planning, counseling, and services to women so that they can space in between their pregnancies. And then giving the right nutrition for mothers and children. And also educating them on preventive measures of some of these, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. Not the STI, science, technology, and innovation. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, so talking about, you know, innovation technologies or how, you know, solutions have really improved upon this. We talk about the telemedicine here, okay, where you have to, um, to triage even your patients by, you know, um, using, you know, um, digital means, um, surveillance using digital means, um, doing telediagnosis and, you know, teletreatment so that you don't necessarily have to travel all the way to you know, a remote area, having difficulty in transportation and what have you. There's telesurgery, teleradiology, so just radiogram. Immediately, you know, a specialist is there to um, give comments and then pass the results back to you. You don't necessarily have to wait for days and weeks, you know, to get your radiographer, you know, commenting on your results. And then also teleeducation. We need constant education, even in the medical field. So you are not just stuck to one thing and it's like, that's all I know. There's always, you know, need for you to address yourself with new, you know, innovations and technology so that you know how to improve upon the healthcare of individuals, especially with our mothers and children. So the implementation of innovating solutions are really needed to improve success to quality healthcare, reducing maternal and child mortality, and also enhancing overall health outcomes, such as you know, um, this to talk about. So having SMS reminders to send in messages to pregnant women to remind them of antenatal care and appointments for them to come in, and also you know, having mobile health apps that is being developed for us to be able to provide health information that will track you know, maternal as well as health of the you know children and it gives indications of what is going on and then you can intervene immediately and then telemedicine using telemedicine to connect you know your healthcare providers with your clients especially in remote areas and these are very very important right and also taking digital health records so you need the implementation of an electronic health record to improve data management to track patient history so that if if you travel outside one region to another region with this, you know, digital health record, they can easily interconnect and then you'll be able to receive medication or, you know, treatment wherever you find yourself instead of traveling all the way to the point of where you had, you know, the first treatment or first being seen by a specialist or a health provider. So these are very, very important. Then also there's a need of community-based interventions where you train community health workers that will provide the essential health services like um, antenatal care, postnatal care and immunization and then also having the chip compounds, you know, for easy access and all that. So you're empowering community health workers to mobilize community as well as promoting health behaviors. And they also relate well with their community members because they know them. So if you come from different environment, different, you know, um, region or different district or community and come in there, there's a bit of, you know, shyness and drawing away, but training their own, they feel, you know, more relaxed and more, you know, open to them to share their ideas and what have you. And also using cultural appropriate messages because, you know, we all have different cultural practices. Just as yesterday, you know, we were taught that a minute of prayer is better than you praying or maybe, you know, different, you know, religions are all here. So it's very, very important for us to really, you know, respect the cultural differences of individual and making sure that we use the appropriate messages and channels to raise this awareness so that you don't step on toes of people in as much as you're trying to, you know, improve lives for these people. Right. So now we want to look at, you know, 
um, genomic medicine, understanding the terms that are really, you know, involved. I believe one, um, the doctor talked about, you know, genomic medicine, biosystems and, and biospecimen, and then the biobanking, but I would want to bring it more into the health issue of mothers and then children. So basically you having, you know, when we say genomic medicine, you're talking about the genomic information about our DNA, that you know all of us seated here we have about 99.9 percent .9 similarities okay it's only 0.1 difference that makes you know you so unique that one individual may be you know less prone to a disease condition and another person will be more prone to it so can easily be gotten you know any kind of disease condition as compared to another just because of that point one variation is very very important and that's what we scientists use mostly to understand what is going on you know in in the by, um, ecosystem Right, so all this will give us the information for us to be able to give personalized treatment strategies to the individual, incorporating it into our day-to-day, -day, you know, clinical, you know, interventions for our clients. So with this, genomic medicine could be, you know, applied in being able to test, you know, prenatal genetic screening, identifying any form of disorder and you know, mutations in the fetus that the mother is carrying. You could also be able to assess any risks where genetic factors would influence the woman's risk of, you know, any pregnancy-related complications so that it can be easily intervened. And then also detecting of, you know, neonatal diseases, genetic disorders that is to do with any mutations, you know, in the newborn, like sickle cell disease, you know, and others that you can think of. And then also precision medicine is very, very important. We are now tailoring, you know, our medical treatment to the need of the individual based on their genetic profile so that it's specific and it saves time it saves money so you don't do just try and error and it's not you know every shoe size fitting all no one size of shoe does not fit everybody everyone has his own you know special size that you or he or she will wear so it's very very important that you know we incorporate precision medicine in our day-to-day -day, you know um medicine or healthcare delivery to our clients Right, so genom genomic medicine has helped us for us to be able to analyze, you know, cell free um, fetal DNA in maternal blood for any chromosomal abnormalities that you can think of. Trisomy 21 is we, you know, an individual having an extra copy, you know, of this chromosome 21. And that's the Down syndrome that we talk about. The 18, trisomy 18 is also acquiring an extra copy of chromosome 18. And then 13 is also acquiring another extra copy of chromosome 13. And individuals with such, you know, um, ab chromosomal abnormality, they don't live long. So children are born and at the age of one, maximum age of one, is, which is very, very sad. And now with advancement in science and technology, they can live to about their early teens and then they are gone, right? But if we have, you know, technological advancement and innovations available for us to be able to use amniotic fluids to be taking, you know, all these abnormalities, you can intervene. And then you don't put the mother in that stress as well as the baby, and then you give birth and then you lose it at the age of one year. You could also use genomic medicine for screening inherited diseases such as cystic fibrosis, um, the sickle cell disease, and the thalassemias, okay? And these are all disorders to do with our blood that will be able to carry blood and oxygen and nutrients to parts of the body, okay? You could also use genomic medicine to assess any risks in the mother. So looking at preeclampsia, you know, genetic markers and also any gestational diabetes markers that you could, you know, be able to, you know, come across and then you can screen for that. Then with the neonates, you could also use metabolic, you know, disorders the hemoglobinopathies like the thalassemias and then the sickle cell anemias and any immune deficiencies, you could be able to detect them and then also, you know, intervene or give the necessary treatment and management. And then pediatric, you know, precision medicine also for any developmental delays and any, you know, intellectual disabilities too, you would be able to use all these, you know, biological, you know, interventions for you to be able to improve upon the lives of both the mother and the little one. Right, so now we want to talk about biospecimen. Obviously, for you to be able to know what is going on in the individual, you need to take you know, specimen. And it could be blood sample, it could be any body fluid that you can talk about, right? So these are you know, uh, materials that you collect from individuals for performing laboratory assays. It could be diagnostics, you know, basic laboratory or you know, um, higher you know, um, technological you know, assays that you may even think of for you to be able to isolate exactly what is wrong in the individual. 
So you can, you know, with a mother, you can take blood sample, you can take Damionis fluid, you could also take placental tissue or even cervical specimen. And there are even now better ways of using the cervical swab to take the specimen for early detection of cervical cancers and other complications. For the neonates, you can take the cord blood, blood spores, saliva samples, and tissue biopsies. And you can use all these for you to be able to identify any disorder or any you know, abnormality that may be going on in both the mother and the child. So you can also you know, um, detect any glucose intolerance test, you know, testing or you know, um, high level of glucose in the blood, hepatitis B and C, you know, through your biospecimen that you may collect. And for the neonates, you know, you could also be able to detect any disability or an inability to be able to break down certain forms of sugar. So not being able to convert, you know, galactose to glucose, that's galactosemia. And you could be able to have this, and this can even affect, you know, the child. So you can use all these blood samples for you to be able to detect. Also for sickle cell disease, you know, an inherited blood disorder that is caused by, you know, the hemoglobin or the, um, the protein molecule that is within the red blood cell and it will you know deform the normal structure of the red blood cell so instead of it having that round you know donuts by concave shape it will have this half moon shape and that occludes you know the blood vessels and then it brings you know all the complications and the pain that you know they normally go through so these are very very important and that will prevent the normal you know flow of oxygen and other nutrients to parts of the body. So with all these biospecimen, you could be able to identify all these you know, um, disorders or conditions in both the mothers and the neonates. Right, and also there's you know, a rare you know, condition that you know, normally you chance on in children, which is to do with a phenylketonuria. So you have buildup of you know, um, phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is one of an amino acid that is being used for producing proteins and it's being built up in, you know, these kids or children. And so you need, you know, a dietitian or a nutritionist to come in to guide both the parents to know how to, you know, um, give, you know, the right nutrition to the little one so that he or she will not be having, you know, difficulty in breaking down and excreting this, you know, um, amino acid in their blood. And all these are very, very important that now, you know, um, both medics and then, you know, scientists as well as um, dietitians are using to really manage, you know, um, mothers and children. So we want to look at the importance of biospecimen. So obviously for diagnostic accuracy, which will ensure timely and effective treatment, would also want to look at disease monitoring where you can track the disease progression and also monitor the treatment response. Likewise, for any research advancements leading to new diagnosis of therapeutic strategies, and then also for optimizing treatment that will enhance, you know, treatment efficacy, which is very, very important. Okay. Right, so now I want to look at biobanking. Obviously, having taken the sample and then having finished working with it, you need to bank them, you need to store them, right, for future use. So these are very, very important. So they are organized collection of specimen or biospecimen that are associated, you know, um, data and, you know, related information because you're definitely going to churn out, you know, data from the sample or the analysis that you have done. And then you need to store them and then manage them for research purposes, for diagnostic purposes, as well as therapeutic purposes. So if, you know, you've, you've taken sample over a long period of time, you may be able to know that the diversity, right, or the population, and you know, you know, which individual fall within a certain group of, you know, um, condition, and then you could use this sample to do further analysis, and then you can intervene or even improve upon treatments that will be rendered to all these individuals. So it's very, very important we having the banks, you know, storage in place for us to be able to effectively manage both our mothers and our children. So the role of this biobank is for systemic collection of bio biological specimen. And then there should be a standardization of you collecting it. So, you know, what you do in Nairobi should be, shouldn't be different from what is done, you know, in Ghana. There should be, you know, a standardized way of storing and processing your samples. And then also, you know, data management and sharing is very, very important. The ethical values that go with it is very, very important. And then also, you know, facilitating research. So having, you know, um, um, 
MOUs or you know agreements that falls between how to transport even samples between the regions and then the other you know analysis that one would want to conduct so that you know the ethical values of it is being enhanced so that you don't just take the sample that you're going to use it for this and then you end up using it for something different it needs to be guided so that you use the sample accordingly as is being stated or as you want to do it so the significance of this is for you know population specific genetic data and we know that we blacks are highly genetically diverse okay as compared to the caucasians or the asians so it's very very important that we collect our own data and then we do our research so that we know how diverse we are what our genetic profile is and then that will help us for us to be able to intervene giving our personalized you know um, medication so that it's not like every drug given to us is what will rather help us maybe what has been done using the caucasian will not work equally well in us as you know Africans so it's very very important for us to have you know um, population specific genetic data for analysis and for the way forward of improving on our health also you know with this data or biobanking you are able to you know um, support clinical research and then also for any disease surveillance and then for treatment you know development it really helps us for us to be able to you know invest into this and then you know improve upon all these things so how are these you know connected these technologies that we are talking about how are they interconnected for us to be able to incorporate it into you know um, both mothers and children so data flow after you've collected your samples obviously you need to store them and then you do the analysis your genomic analysis having gotten your results then you give it to the doctor or the specialist and then they'll be able to use the results from the analysis and then we'll be able to treat the patient Having done that, then you'll be able to know the diagnostic pathway. What measures are you putting in place? What screening method do you want to use for the history that you've collected from the individual? What type of sample are you collecting? And what diagnostic method are you using for the analysis? Then are there any risk factors that may be associated with the you know, um, diagnostic approach that you want to do? What is the genetic profiling that you've been able to churn out from the analysis that you've done? Then you'll be able to really manage and manage properly. And then also selecting the right treatments to give to the individual, you know, the genetic based therapy, any personalized protocol that you'd want to use. And then there will be real time adjustment. So as and when you're giving the treatment, you'll be able to adjust in it and then improving upon the outcome. And then by then doing, you have monitored the treatment and then giving, you know, evaluating the efficacy of the treatment and then tracking the process, you know, or the progress of the child as well as the mother so all these are really really important okay so here you start you start with your applicants okay diverse you know um, population diverse you know genetic profiling and then you collect your data having collected your data you follow up with the information that you know you generate from the individual okay and then you'll be able to use the right diagnostic tool for the analysis and then having been able to analyze them you get your data and then you store your samples that's your biobanking so your integrated biobanking will now go into your genomic medicine where you'll be able to now use the profiling data that you've gotten and then you'll be able to intervene and give the right treatment to the mother and the child as and when needed based on the profiling that you've got because of the genetic data you've been able to generate Right, so now, how do you, you know, apply this genomic medicine and biospecimen in maternal, neonatal, and child health? So for prenatal screening, obviously, you can use the biospecimen using maternal blood that, you, you know, you use it for an non-invasive, you know, prenatal testing. And this will help you to be able to detect some of the chromosomal abnormalities that I've mentioned, the Down syndrome, the trisomies that we've talked about, and other genetic disorders. Likewise, you could also use it to, you know, assess risks. So for any genetic risk profiling, for identifying, you know, risks for um, preeclampsia, um, gestational diabetes, and other, you know, um, conditions that the mother may, may face during the pregnancy. And this, you could intervene and then, you know, um, improve upon the health of the mother. And also personalized care plans are put in place because you are using, you know, the genetic information from these biospecimens and then that will guide your personalized treatment decisions such as drug therapy and then being able to, you know, um, know example like an anticoagulation therapy for clotting factors in the mother or even the child. So you are able to really, you know, help the individual so that you don't have any, you know, emboli or any um, blood clots that would block the vessels and that can lead 
to any serious you know um conditions so these are very very important that we need to look at the team is not responding <laughs> technology can you please um control from there for me please thank you is it low battery or something because it's off right so for neonatal child health you could you could also use the bio specimen such as blood from your nat or from the neonat or the newborn and then you use it for you know screening for genetic diseases like sickle cell disease yes um, for sickle cell disease and then also for disease prevention so using tissue biopsies you are able to identify any risk factors for childhood diseases and then that will really allow us to prevent measures and lifestyle modification for these children and then for optimizing treatment so genetic information from the bio specimens will help optimize drug therapy and minimize any side effects that you know the child may be able to face by ingesting those medication to apply it in children, you know, you can use it for disease management, where these biospecimen are used for genetic testing and diagnosis, as well as managing rare genetic conditions, such as the gotcha, you know, um, disease. This is build up, you know, that um, the child is not able to break down certain fats, and these are rare conditions, you know, that exist in children. So you can use all these, you know, um, specimen to be able to, you know, identify these conditions or these diseases in the children, and then you can intervene. The maple syrup urine disease is also one where there's buildup of, you know, toxins in the blood and urine of the child. So you also need to intervene and then you'll be able to, you know, um, help treat these, you know, um, conditions in the kid. And then I've already mentioned the phenylketonuria, where you can break down certain proteins, so there'll be buildup of it in you. So knowing all these, the um, dietitian as well as the nutritionist will come in for, you know, telling you which kind of foods to ingest or take and which ones to avoid. And this is very, very important. Nutrition is part of our health being or well-being. So it's very important that we look in that direction as well. Also monitoring developmental, you know, stages, you know, we can use biobanks and biospecimen um, from children to identify any genetic factors that will contribute to, you know, um, developmental delays or any disabilities in the children. And then also preventive care. So you can give genetic counseling using information from the biospecimens that you've collected and then assessing any family history that, you know, run across them and then identifying the children that will be at risk of, you know, acquiring these diseases sometime in the future. And then you'll be able to give them the right genetic counseling and that needs to be used for, you know, um, their day to day activity. So all these are really, really important by, you know, incorporating and implementing this, we are able to, you know, in Africa, the human hereditary um, and health in Africa, which is the H3 Africa, which most of us are aware of, you know, it's an initiative that was used, you know, in countries like, you know, Nigeria and South Africa, using genomic data for us to be able to study, you know, genetic factors that you know affect mothers and children health and that is really really important also where i come from in ghana in our center which is you know there are three centers right um of excellence one that deals with um agricultural crops one that deals with you know malaria and non-communicable diseases and then one that deals with genetic okay looking at the um, genome profiling and what have you and that's the work make so west african you know genetic center or medicine center so here we, we i'm affiliated to them so if i say we yes so we focus on sickle cell disease detection and sickle cell gene editing okay so um we know that two percent of you know um children that are born in ghana are you know having this condition or sickle cell disease and that accounts to about 75 percent mortality of life birth, which is very very alarming so now this you know project or the center is looking at you know sequencing um individuals or children that are being diagnosed of sickle cell disease and then know their profiling the arrangements of their nuclear you know the um, building blocks of their dna see whether they're in you know deletion 
any gap, any differences between them, right? And then they'll be able to do gene editing and then we'll be able to intervene so we can improve upon this and um, the lifespan of these individual and the complications that they go, they go through. So all these things are being done and we you know highly advanced. Likewise, in the MRC in Gambia, they also use data and biospecimen to understand, you know, um, childhood diseases and immunity. And here in Camry, we also know that it's one of the largest research, you know, um, institutions um, that is dedicated to health research, including maternal and health care. Yes, please. I'm almost done. Thank you. So now we're looking at some biobanks. So the H3 Africa you know, network in South Africa, we have the Nigeria Biobank Initiative. We have the Kenya, you know, the Kemri Biobank. We have the um, AGMC Biobank. We have the Malawi one, and then we have the one in Ghana, which is you know, the largest, you know, sickle cell disease biobank in the whole world. Over 30,000 30, samples is what we have. And then we are sequencing over 7,000, you know, children that are diagnosed with sickle cell anemia. And we're looking at, their, you know, um, genetic profiling, and then we'll be able to intervene. And some are also being, you know, um, taken to the states in Yale University for them to be able to, you know, further understudy them. And those that have not been on hydroxyurea is very, very key. And they are recruited into the study for them to be able to intervene for the adults. Right. So challenges we already outlined. There's no, you know, some of the challenges, you know, for you to be able to implement these, you know, cost of technology, need for trained personnel. But what are the benefits after, you know, these are being implemented? There's improved disease prevention. There's better treatment outcomes. And then also, you know, this enhances, you know, um, research capabilities. So all these things are very, very important. And looking at, you know, um, successful stories in, you know, Africa, we have the South Africa integration of genomic testing in prenatal care. We have the Kenya's, you know, developmental or development of biobanking facilities for, you know, pediatric research. In Rwanda, they also use digital health records for maternal care. And then in Ghana, we are using the sickle cell disease genomic, you know, of African projects. And that's where I'm talking about sequencing about 7,000, you know, um, individuals, you know, um, genome. And, it's, it's really an important thing. So what is the roadmap for achieving, you know, our SDG three for, you know, maternal neonates child health in Africa? So yes, we have to strengthen the health systems, invest into the health, you know, resources of health, improving health infrastructure, and enhancing supply of chain management, right? It's very, very important. Then we also need to expand access to healthcare, you know, um, systems or quality, utilizing the mobile health technologies and introducing any health insurance schemes that, you know, both benefit whether you, you know, attend, you know, a government hospital or a private hospital, all these are very, very important and has to be, you know, available for people to be able to, you know, um, enjoy at a cost, obviously, but I mean, an affordable one. And also promoting preventive health, strengthening immunization programs, preventing and controlling infectious diseases, addressing malnutrition is very, very key. Okay. And then this world will help us to be able to improve maternal health care by reducing, you know, child mortality. It's very, very important for us to be able to do that. So to bring my talk to a close. Um, I would want to highlight the fact that emerging technologies like genomic medicine biospecimen and biobank has really transformed, you know, maternal, neonatal and child health in Africa and thereby offering, you know, the innovative solutions to the longstanding, you know, um, challenges that we've highlighted. And these technologies will really enable, you know, early detection, personalized treatment, and also improved outcomes for both mothers and children, helping us to be able to bridge the gap of you know, um, that is being seen in our healthcare delivery. So the future of maternal and neonatal child health in Africa lies in harnessing the power of these technologies to create the health systems that are more you know, responsive, efficient, and then equitable because everybody has to be able to enjoy and then have access to it. So I'll therefore call on all the stakeholders that are gathered here to work together to ensure that these technologies are maintained and being efficient and kept running. So together, I believe that we can turn our innovations into an action for a healthier Africa. Thank you for your attention. Pensive presentation. As I was listening, I was really hoping that we had a team of doctors here with us, you know, to really learn this. But who knows, we do have uh, our health experts from the RECS 
and I'm sure that uh, maybe down the road you would be invited to make this presentation at the national level or the regional level. Thank you so much. Uh, yesterday we heard quite a bit about CISA 2034 and uh, it was referred to quite a bit. So at this point, we're going to invite our colleague, Mr. Lukovic Seke, to make a presentation, giving us the status and uh, more detailed information about CISA 2034. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jacina. Uh, I have my presentation. I don't know if I can have it from the screen. And uh, before I proceed, I just need once again to express our sincere um, Gratitude to Afidet. Uh, uh, you follow what uh, Prof. Ambali was saying that uh, he started saving since 2004. And uh, I think Africa need to learn and learn further because uh, if we don't learn, we are going to continue with our mistakes. I don't know if you can give me a, an African country uh, where they still keep two or three presidents that, that have been before to always consult with the current president to guide him to avoid mistakes and to, can you have? Okay, so, okay. Okay, uh, uh, in case you don't have, it means that, oh, wonderful. Okay, if you don't have, I just need to let you know that we never had bad president. We never had bad president, but we can have dangerous advisors. You can have a good husband who can become a very bad husband because a bad wife. You can have a bad husband who, who can become a good husband because of a very good wife. So it means that we need to learn from mistakes from those who can guard us and to avoid uh, 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 sustaining our mistakes. So what is happening, I told you yesterday that as Africa, we have a vision. Our vision is the Africa we want in 2063. Only God knows if this has will still be there until then because of the nuclear race. But we still have hope that everything will be okay. In what we say in economics, everything remaining unchanged. So uh, for us to achieve that vision, each portfolio should bring is contribution. And that contribution on our side in this venue is the science, technology, and innovation contribution. But the beauty of it is that we can never say that science, technology, and innovation should remove in solo. Science, technology, and innovation is cross-cutting. Is why in this venue we have a nexus, science, technology, and innovation, as well as uh, health. And we congratulate all the recs being in this venue because it's very challenging for us as a UD Nepal to achieve in a coordinating the implementation without your support. We'll be invading your privacy, coming in your region, doing things with member state, you are not aware of it. So we really need you to be uh, in this process all the time with us and is our collective responsibility. Uh, I'm going to talk about the drafting of uh, the next decade, the next iteration of the policy that we should have. And when I ask a question, why are we calling it a strategy than calling it a policy? Because a policy is a decision, is a law in any country when we have a policy. I'm told that we prefer strategy because a country can endorse or, or ac can accept to use it or not. So it's why we are like recommending is a strategy to consider, but is endorsed at the continental level by ministers so far. And this draft, it had been approved last week, we have been so busy with ministers from Monday to Friday. So it's going to be put on the table of head of state and government in, uh, during the summit, the uh, African uh, assembly, uh, for them to endorse it and then it become uh, binding. So the outline is as follow, uh, process of the drafting, key futures, structures of that uh, 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 strategy, sectors and priorities, governance, implementation phases, resources, communication, monitoring, evaluation, learning, as well as conclusion. Here we have the phases. For your information, it's very important when we are managing science, technology, and innovation to understand where we came from. If we don't understand where we came from, 
we, are, we cannot understand where we are going. We, we are no longer in the era of the organization Africa Unity where we have to fight with uh, all non-African who did colonize us. We're having a very revolutionary rhetoric. Then we became free. We are now in the era of the African Union. Under the era of the African Union, we are considering the same people who colonize us through partnership to support us. But we need to be very careful without selling our birthright. They cannot come and put the law in our sitting room and bedrooms. We need to have a level of sovereignty. And for that, we say that we need to have a task force. We have been part of the task force as a UNEPAD, your institutions. So we had uh, our first meeting in May, and we also had a drafting team. And that drafting team was reporting to us, task force. We also had member from uh, Rex and so forth. We have the first drafting team meeting in June, the second drafting team meeting in July. Uh, here it was in Kenya. Uh, uh, at the uh, African Academy of Science. There it was at the uh, African Continental Free Trade Area in July. And then we have several weekly online meetings, okay? Still the drafting team. And then we had the task force meeting in July to take stock what that drafting team did. And then we moved to the online continental consultation and we congratulate uh, this coalition that we have between AUD and NEPAD and AFIDEP. We got some input in Malawi. And also we, got, we went there, it was the third drafting team meeting, September in Egypt, and we ended up with uh, the draft AU member state uh, uh, that had been said to, to AU member state for them to give their view during STISA, uh, during the ministerial meeting. Then we are having some future, key future and value addition of STISA. There is something we should never forget in this venue. Even though I don't have something to eat when I leave this venue, I should be very proud with my jacket not to show it because I'm an African. So we should be proud of ourselves. Af Africa, we should never sell Africa. Africa is not for sale. And that's the spirit we should have when we leave this place. Number one, inclusivity. So we have been guided through this process. This is the presentation that has been made to, uh, to the permanent secretary, this in the senior official segment and ministers as well. So inclusiveness is very important. Number two, recommendation from the review of what we had in the past, the first decade of STI contribution to Agenda 263. We made mistakes. We never had an implementation plan. So we took those recommendations to improve once again. Alignment with the second 10-year implementation plan. As I said, we have a vision for up to 2063, but that vision is broken into decades. We need to make sure that uh, the flagship program we have under those, uh, uh, the decadal, uh, uh, if I have to say that in English, if I don't know if I say it right. So the STISA is in compliance with that. Okay. So uh, for us, we consider uh, uh, STISA like our national policy on STI and uh, the second 10 year implementation plan like our national development plan. So we need to align with that. And then we need to build on uh, AU sectoral frameworks. As I said, we are the SCR sectors. We need to see the health, manufacturing, and so forth to align with those. Because we have some cross-cutting recommendations, we need to be very careful. Impact pathway, fuel of change indeed. Emphasis on science policy is very important. And partnership is crucial. As I said, the same that colonizers we have been insulting, those who have been extremists, but we need to be very diplomatic. Say it very well that we don't need that, but we have to collaborate together. We need to involve the youth as well. The private sector, the, the problem of our private sector, they always see us as enemy in the government sector, if I say so. Because they have to pay tax, they don't like you. So you need to create a very conducive policy in, on, on innovation to say tax incentive. At least you do that. If you don't do that, it will be just clashing all the time. And then we have the issue of frontier technology. And we told the audience, the drafting team, as well as the task force, we cannot create a new jargon here. We have a decision taken to establish an African Union high level panel on emerging technology. Why to create another synonymous here? We need to keep emerging technology. Otherwise, we'll be just reinventing the wheel. So it was a big battle as AUD and NEPA to say, we don't need frontier technology, but if you need to keep it, then let us put emerging and frontier technology. But still, if we discover in the document that they didn't do that, 
I'm giving you the rationale. Maybe it will be a mistake, but we need to make sure that your president can take that. Um, luckily here, we don't have member state, only think tanks. At least as Rex, you can also flag that aspect in making it happen. We have the issue of fermentation plan. So the structure of TISA, number one, introduction, we need to go back to the first framework we had. Among the people who did uh, work for that, we have Prof. Ambali. What happened with the first policy we had? It was a consolidated document. The African Union Commission, the department in charge of human resources and science and technology, came up to discuss with AUD and NEPAD to take what the NEPAD secretary was having in terms of science and technology to put together those programs. And that's what we call Africa's Science and Technology Consolidated Plan of Action. And if you check your Google, you will see Prof Mugabe, Prof Ambali. Those are the two champions. It's why, as I said, we can never get rid of them because they have their history. By the time you get rid of them, you are losing because they will take them. So that's what we need to keep in mind. So don't be surprised if in the next meeting we beg them to come. So number two. Uh, and after that, we have the uh, Lagos Plan of Action. In the Lagos Plan of Action, that too, it was not a policy. It was like the uh, Agenda 2063, where you found science, technology, and innovation as a provision in the long-term vision. That provision was saying each country should put at least 1% of its GDP in scientific uh, activities. Okay? But now, with time we change, it's no longer in scientific activity, capability, apology, but now is 1% uh, of your GDP should be going to research. And 1% of your GDP is not coming in your parliament. What is coming from your parliament is the government expenditure that you can control. Your GDP is coming from what came from business enterprises, tertiary institutions, all those aspects. And then we have the global trend. That's what we have in the introduction, including the AU innovation agenda and so forth. Number two, conceptual analysis. We have the change happening in terms of socioeconomic challenges, continental initiative, all those. Number three, vision. We need an integrated, prosperous, peaceful Africa. Peaceful Africa. Why am I saying that? Because Africa is still re resolving conflicts. 70% of our African Union budget is going to peace and security. And I'm always saying to people, there is a mafia here. Someone is selling weapons to push Africans to fight, to have airplane, to have consultancy. Just investigate. Most of the UN plane used when we have a UN mission. Some of the lobbyist people abroad who are renting them to the United Nations, those are contracts. And it's not correct. So we need to address the issue of conflict development. And when you check most of those conflicts, bad advisors around some of the head. So we cannot implement STI if there is no peace. And we have to harness the transformative power of STI uh, to accelerate Africa transition. 33 countries out of 55, we are least developed countries. That's the UN jargon. People feel offended when we put it in our proposal for the measurement uh, program on STI. We say this is not an insult. It's uh, the way we are standing, the, the ranking is happening. We are listed 33, 73% of LDCs are African. It's not good. We are not poor. It's a problem of mindset. So now we are told that we have to reach the level of middle income countries by 2033. So this is still the structure. And then we have number four. Objectives, competitive Africa, we are facing globalization. We must face again the continental free trade area where countries are already disputing. Because if my product from Malawi is more powerful than your product in South Africa, people will consume Malawi. And then if I'm an emotional South African and close my border, I don't need your product to come here. So that was happening in some region where because of rice, a country was just complaining about that. So we need to be very careful with, and we need to have good policies. Those are the aspects. Sector, number five, we have sectors and priority. And number six, we have making it happen. Let us go to the next one. 
Those are the sectors we need to cover. Sector number one is agriculture, because as I said yesterday, in terms of human development index, we are going to remain with the three main indicators. Index number one, life expectancy. Life expectancy is related to wash, wealth. Oh, sorry. Life expectancy is related to wash, water, uh, health, and sanitation. Is it okay? So for you to be in this venue, you have to be in good condition. So, and then agriculture and health, they are going together. If you don't eat, you just be shaking. Then we go to ICT, you need to communicate. We go to energy and we have environment, climate change and biodiversity. So those are the sectors, but we need to have some strategic priority. We cannot do everything as Africa. Number one, science diplomacy is very important. And then uh, before Prof. Ambali leaves, he gave us an assignment to prepare for in some section of a presentation should make. I never submit mine. I was a culprit because I was trying to make it like a, is a, 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 a end of a document to praise the work is legacy. What happened in that document? I finished with the first segment, but the second segment I didn't finish. In terms of science diplomacy, the US was so arrogant in brackets. I'm not insulting the US. They didn't shoot down the balloon from China that was passing through the US in the space that is not yours because up there is not your space. And they were so arrogant that they should, they know they are spying on us because of lack of discussion. If other colleagues are improving their technology, you cannot make it. Just ask them, how do you make it? Because we have the International Space Station. So science diplomacy is very crucial. Number two, youth and gender. We need to empower our youth because they cannot be on TikTok just dancing. They need to show how I can do, uh, 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 how do we call it? Uh, you call it the uh, genome editing. How I can take a, a, a papa that not sweet or orange to show them that we were doing that, okay? So this emerging technology we are having today is what is happening? We have private sector engagement and industrialization, okay? We have capacity and competencies and we have frontier technology. They forgot again, they removed the emerging technologies. Capacity and competencies. When Prof. I was leaving, we went to Brussels because we have to implement the African Union, European Union innovation agenda for 82 countries, 55 on our side as Africa, 27 from the European side. Prof. Ambali asked them, please, can you change your, your criteria? With this EU call we are putting, most of our African countries are not making it. They told Prof. we cannot change those. We just need to capacitate countries that are weak. So it means that. We need to train our younger people to avoid dancing through TikTok. They have to show those technology for others to understand because if we go to the narrative of dancing, it's not good. So we need to empower. Our musicians should be given the content to go on TV to train the younger people and to tell people, go to school, don't follow me. I'm doing that to feed my kids. I'm sending them to Europe while we are watching my music. So then we have the issue of uh, emerging technology. As I'll be finishing soon, I don't have many slides. I need to give some example in the health sector. Expansion of social protection is very important. And for that, we need basic here. We need to secure first universal access to basic uh, primary health care. After that, we have free education is very important. I need to give you an example here what happened in my country, even though I'm no longer a Congolese. Once you work for the African Union, you forget your citizenship, you work for the continent. We had a musician who go in the hospital, found a lady that had been kept there. She could not pay after delivering for three months. The hospital will keep you. Or if you don't pay, we cannot give you medication. People are dying. You follow the story in other countries. Luckily, the president said we have to achieve what we call universal access, meaning you are free, you go to the school, they treat you. In Africa, in South Africa, it's happening. So it's very important. Education, free basic education is very important. If you don't educate a young lady, and they, talk, they will tell her, if you don't go with a man, when you get married, you have difficulty to have uh, uh, kids. She will follow that advice from someone who needs to abuse her. 
So if you don't tell her that keep yourself very clean, then she will just, you need to secure free education, sexual education for them. So we all those aspects. So that's how we have to proceed. Now, bullet number two, use essential medicine, commodity, security, and another thing we achieve. We are having a, an African medicine agency. This was a program to harmonize our regulation in pharmaceutical as product. And Professor Mbali was leading that. And today we have an agency on the continent. It's not an easy matter because we have a big uh, 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 conglomerate who can sh shout down a researcher on the continent. So we have been very smart. We survived, at least no one did pass away. We have an agency, we have to be proud of it. And we need to proceed. Number three, R&D of vaccine and therapeutic against emerging threats. Very important. Number four, African pandemic and epidemic emergency preparedness. We need to get ready on our own. Because they are saying, we are lucky because that, uh, that uh, COVID came from China. If it came from Africa, we should be ashamed once again because we are always blamed, we are the source of all the diseases. So, and we have network of center of excellence. It's very important, health and genomic. We follow the guru in the field. Let us take another example in terms of accelerating sustainable and inclusive industrialization. The only way for us to survive today is to industrialize. Otherwise, all our infant industry will close because we have mass production with uh, uh, emerging, uh, latest technology. We cannot afford the price of China product. So we need to also empower our own. Action. Here we have overall objective of this priority is to boost African industrialization potential. Okay, action, we need to increase investment in open science, digitalization and industrial research. Okay. And we are expecting to export up to 20% uh, manufacturing product and to increase the contribution to the GDP. Uh, to digital service support to six percent number two develop tools for technology assessment and technology foresight exercises to assist country to identify and develop critical technology to boost efficiency and the quality of production okay and we have to establish world-class and disruptive smart infrastructure for manufacturing we need more engineers because we can go to literacy is good but we need to train our young people to love mathematics if they ate it if you have a a teacher who's not well trained, he will push the kid to eight mathematics. So we need to assess even the teachers because if you're a bad teacher, you will you'll, you'll push kid to, to hate that subject. So example of action for building human capability, capital infrastructure and skills. The strategic objective is to strengthen the digital and technological infrastructure and the human resource development to better implement priority sector program. Number one, action increased financial resources allocated to R&D. I'm thanking my colleague, uh, uh, Maria, because she invited me to join a domestic financing program of the University of Nairobi. Uh, we are planning to secure a proposal from 2026 to 2030 as part of the counting down of uh, the 2030 agenda on sustainable development goal to help country to track their in domestic in investment. Nigeria, congratulations, Nasetem, they are having a dashboard. We are doing something with uh, Brazil. South Africa is also doing the same, and uh, Kenya need to have an observatory. They need that to come next week, Monday, to train them how to collect data. So it's very important for us. How may we increase our resources if we don't have a baseline? You need to know, because I can increase the resources, but how can I tell you that I didn't increase? I need to know a baseline and where I'm going. So we need to have a dashboard. So innovation and skill development. And we also have a grand challenge, something very important put in place. When Prof. Ambali and Dr. Jina were leaving, we have Rwanda, other countries, so something very good. They don't need you to be just your babysit all the time. You put money, we also put money, otherwise you'll be just receiving. And it's not bad, it's not good for us. So uh, we need to upgrade, increase investment in STEM and TVET. We need to make sure that our students who are coming from uh, University don't undermine their colleagues, their colleagues from colleges. I'm from the university, you are from a college. No, MIT is not a university. So, but they're doing very well. So that mindset, we need to fix it. So uh, upgrade and develop critical uh, research and innovation infrastructure with a focus on shared infrastructure. We have to share and we call it innovation. You can be in a facility, someone is so fit that is proud, he keep the key in the pocket. If I'm not there, no one will work. So we have to share with others. Mindset, 
So conduct and support promotion of education and strong culture of science is very important. We need science, otherwise we'll be lagging. In terms of governance, as those are the last slide, as I was saying that uh, we are having the United Nations Assembly, UNGA, General Assembly, and we also have, as the African Union, we also have our own African Union Assembly, uh, where head of states and the government are meeting. Uh, but uh, that assembly is part of what we call the, uh, the summit, because we also have other meetings. And after that, we have the executive councils, the permanent and executive committee, and so forth. We have uh, what we're calling in the past ministers clusters, cluster meeting uh, conferences. Now they are uh, uh, STCs. But when we go now to the side of implementation of, uh, of STISA, so we have uh, the, the, the AU department and organ. Uh, indeed, they cannot, they cannot implement. They cannot implement because we were doing our best to have AUD in Nepal, because that's the only development agency we have on the continent. But uh, we understand also the resistance. So, uh, uh, we, we, in terms of implementation, implementation should start here. Regional economic communities, you have to implement. You, you have to coordinate the implementation with us. And we have member states, but here we should have AUD in Nepal, because when it comes to the implementation, the African Union Commission can no longer implement. We are the one to coordinate the implementation. So, uh, and then we have the think tanks. Academia. So things are very quicker with AFIDEP or the NGO think tank in the venue. Because if you need to pass to the minister, you need to wait for the minister to come and open. And then you will start at 11 o'clock. It's busy. You need approval. So we need to be very innovative. But we also recognize the support from our ministries. So we need to be very fast and to catch up. We don't need to be like those who wake up at 3 p.m. And you, can, you have to catch up with those who wake up at 6. So implementation plan this is the last one because there is conclusion and thank you i just did that to show that i'm finishing <laughs> so implementation here i need to let you something very important i was discussing with all the elders and getting what wisdom from profound Bali. we receive a message that canada and uh, Europe, they need to support her to develop the implementation plan. When I was told, I was not happy. They need to give us money. I was not happy. I went to tell the chief of staff who's acting as head of science technology innovation, as the chief of staff. Can, go, can I go to someone to ask him if I can impregnate my wife? Can I go to someone to ask him, sorry, doc, can I impregnate my wife? She's my wife. I don't need permission. Why people are coming to us to say we need to give you money to develop your implementation plan? We are not. We are Africa. We have to be proud of it. Even though I don't have a bread, I have to be proud to consult with my brother for us to address this problem. They need to support us. Then they will say we supported Africa to develop his implementation plan. There's no pride on us to get money. We need them to support us in programs. And I told the chief of staff, we need to work with South Africa because we're in South Africa at least. And Prof Ambali also told me, Seke, follow the organic approach. Uh, because we love his wisdom. We need to consult him. Prof, what's your view? He said, yeah, he's not bad. And we, I told him, we can maybe use that, that support from Europe and other to use for program. Yeah, but use the organic approach. Why? We need to listen to those who have been there before us. Number two, leadership. This is what we need to develop. We could use this forum to do that. And they're expecting it from us. We cannot give it to aid of state and government. We got permission from ministers and it's over. So by the time we finish, we carry on. Leadership. It will be part of the implementation plan. A robust system, structure, phase approach, stakeholder roles and responsibility, financing, communication. So we need you, Rex. If you have a bit of money, send us a message. And if you need to host us, let us handle our own linen as African. Apologies. Now, conclusion. 
We did show it before. We need the Rex. That was the weakest link. I was very shocked. I'm not saying that to undermine. I diplomatically correct. And we are in the venue, nothing is recorded. I was surprised that one day someone told me at certain AU organ, people are refusing to travel. Ah, okay. <laughs> Good. And because it's recorded, I would not say that. Yeah. So it was an issue of us to honor the process. So all REC member, even though you don't have PDM, please join this process. Mem all the, please, this is our responsibility. We have been appointed to support those processes. Even though someone doesn't need you to attend that meeting because the person needs to under, please make sure that you remain silent, but support us even virtually. One day people will know the role you are playing. We don't need vacuum. Because if there is a vacuum, the seat is empty. Let us take, because in this venue, we are having wrecks. So this is a plea. Why am I saying that? Because for the last 17 years, I was following my mentor, Prof. Ambali, and Dr. Tina, my boss. So what was happening is that we are seeing some, uh, we are so reluctant. It's not good. We need that revolution. And I thank uh, uh, Dr. Fortunate because he has some budget. Dr. Fortunate, thank you for that to support ESC countries on STI. So we need to be very aggressive, and if we have a budget, also human, human resources is good. So all those we are the, here should play that role. Youth, NGO, media, innovators, diaspora. We need a diaspora, consider as one of the segment as part of the African Union to support us. And with that, uh, I think I'm done. If I didn't manage my time properly, uh, 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 apology for that, but I just need to finish with one thing. Uh, there is a story that I've been told. People saw a very old guitar, and that guitar was uh, very cheaper. No one was taking attention. No one was taking attention. Pay no one was paying attention. No one was even buying it until someone who, who knew how to use that guitar came and then removed the dust from the guitar. And then when the person played that guitar, everyone came. You know what is happening in, at the airport when we have the train. When people are playing guitar, people come around. It means that. We must, we all, they all always say we don't have money. We don't have money. But when I heard the genome editing, Katajena, when someone did play that, say, oh, it's like this. So we need to play that tune of STI. For others, oh, you were right. So we didn't know that the, the knife was not for us to, to kill one another. So the, the knife is important, but it's not for you to cut your brother. The knife is for onion. It's how you put it, so it's up to you. Those are emerging technologies. So it's like a knife. Either you use it in the kitchen for onion or at the table, but someone will be extremist will kill with it. So you need to show that ethical consideration. But don't come because you are not educated in STI. Never use a knife. It's a very dangerous thing. So thank you very much for your attention. So can we have another round of applause for the two presenters? <laughs> I always had my circus passion, you know. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Mr. Seke. This is greatly appreciated. So uh, we've all been educated on a CESA. It's really great to see the implementation plan being developed because when the CESA 2024 was reviewed, I believe the gap that was noticed was the fact that member states were not uh, integrating the CESA 2024 into their national development plans. The reason being the how, how to go about that. They did not really have a good grasp of that. And so they were not unable, they were not able to do that. So it's good to uh, see this uh, new development. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes. The two uh, presentations were very comprehensive, covered all ground. So I don't think we uh, have a lot of questions. However, we have about 15 minutes for questions. So questions and comments 
Okay, I got one hand, Dr. Kazim. Any other? Is that a hand or scratching your hair? Okay. <laughs> okay, Mr. Sunny, we got two, three. Uh, if there's another, we'll take. Uh, okay, there's three for now. So, okay, so short, short uh, questions, please, or short comments. Thank you. All right, Mr. Seke. The need to develop tools for assessment of um, industries to enable um, industrialization. That's sank well with me. That's one of the responsibilities of NASETEM. What is the way forward in this? Do we have a manual, for instance, the STI indicators? We already have some manuals that already prescribed how we did that through our, our series of capacity buildings before we started, that was in 2004, 2003, thereabout. If that is available, I will appreciate you share that. Otherwise, just point me to something so that we can work together on that. Um, I've already seen, of course, um, strong partnership is required. I know you're already partnering with us, but I want us to strengthen it, especially um, some recs are already thinking of how we can work together because that's one of the excess of this kind of dialogue. So thank you. I hope it was short. <laughs> yes, it was, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Mine would be on the last one. I start uh, with the name of the document. You said instead of saying policy, you said strategy. But at the end of the day, it will be approved by the head of states. So, so, so to me, really, according to the African Union um, legal framework, what are the decisions that tied member states that they were obliged to implement. I think you have to consider this one to find out what should be the kind of document you would present for the approval of the head of states. Now, when it comes to the issue of implementation, uh, so I hear call on Rex or these things, but to me, it depends how the document is designed. Because normally, a continental document, to me, should have three components. What will be done by the continent? What will be done by the RECs? What will be done by, by countries? If we structured it this way, everything is clear. That means what the continent will provide the resources for, what the RECs should provide resources for, and what countries would provide the resources for. It's not just that we have decision everyone has, because ar around all this, we have financial envelope. So the continental envelope will be used for what? The regional envelope will be used for what? Then the countries do for So this is what I want to call our attention. You have to look at this way. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so that's what, what I want to say, because I, I'm so surprised to say, if you call a Rex for the issue of per diem. No, I think maybe the system is not well uh, set up. Because normally, it's like the AU summit. I think when when the summit is uh, is convened, country doesn't do, do not ask for them to come. So to me, we should have a kind of framework of meeting between Rex and uh, a Unipad and others, and this can be even part of statutory meetings for the Rex. You know, next next year you have this should be considered statutory meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, the presenters. Uh, Mia have learned a lot. And uh, I like 
uh, what my brother has just highlighted. I think, uh, yeah, so this is the, something that is so huge. Like you had yesterday, many of us were saying we haven't started. We haven't started and we are here to learn and see how we can implement. So a bit of what he raised, being very clear of how the wrecks fit in this big picture and how, what areas we should tackle given the work we do, I think it would make it so much easier for us to implement and then also for at the global level, at the continental level to monitor what Rex are doing. Yeah, um, that said, I had, a, I had, a, I wanted to raise a question about, just a minute, give me a minute. Um, the pre we had a presentation on uh, reproductive maternal newborn and how we can apply genomic medicine and then biobank. Um, I think as listening very keenly about what is being done in the area of uh, sickle cell disease, I know that that has been there for some time, but I was interested to know in particular what if gene editing is actually ongoing and also if scientists here are doing that because I've been part of a study and I know that most, most of these uh, researchers, uh, some of them are developed yeah, and I think that is our biggest link, weak link here. They're developed by uh, many of the universities abroad, and then they get principal investigators from here to collaborate with. And I think my biggest disappointment was the fact that while we did all the work and we collected the specimens and everything, and we collected the data, we didn't have much access to the information that we collected. They just give you rights, very limited, to edit what you have entered in the system, and then they use it for all the other things. So I don't know whether that is happening in this, in this area, whether the scientists here really, really are part and parcel of this edit, because I think that is where we would benefit so here. Or are we just collecting the samples for them? Okay, thank you very much for the questions. So we've got questions from Mr. Seke and uh, Dr. Gloria. I have a, a last uh, minor question. I saw that uh, with the uh, implementers, I saw development partners uh, as part of uh, the implementation of STEZA. And uh, in your presentation, uh, you had mentioned and actually emphasized the fact that this is a uh, an African document and needs to be implemented by us. So I thought that was a bit of, uh, yeah, so if you can clarify that. So if we can have you a uh, quick, quick answers, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Gloria as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jacina. I'm going to thank, uh, to respond from your question. Uh, among the implementers, we have the development partners, okay? So it means that the development partners, we're calling them before donors and we have been advised to remove that terminology donors. They're not giving us, they're also benefiting, is why we are putting development partner. So they can come with their money because in that joint process, we can work together because they might need the, 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 the uh, uh, Congo rainforest. And then we work together, they also benefit from that in terms of uh, 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 environment. But not to come to us, as I was saying, they, they, they are keen to support us, but we should also keep that pride. We need to develop our own implementation plan, then we can share in the future. And uh, the second question to me, uh, I, I did love the way uh, we got the information about uh, this AU legal framework on decision. I think that's something very uh, important. Some decision are binding, and then you sell, not, not you sell, you surrender a portion of your sovereignty. You are part, a country is 
each African country is part of the United Nations. We have 195 countries. Only the city of Vatican is not part of the United Nations. And when a decision has been taken at the United Nations that each person is free to get married how he needs, I can get married to a, a horse. It's happening in other country. People are officially I go, I get married to my kites or my horse, and it's official. I think you know that in some countries, it's happening. And also, uh, same sex is, can also happen. Once that decision is taken in New York, because of you are part of the United Nations, automatically is bonding for your country. Automatically, you need to ratify it. Even when you avoid, they will tell you, no, 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 but you are, you are not compliant. So you are, you, are surrender, you are going to surrender a portion of your sovereignty unless you use another strategic behavior of African. We have also our culture because we can also recommend polygamy. We never took it to New York. We can also take that. So that to show you that how uh, uh, you can lose some of the, something can become binding because of your affiliation. And when it comes to the issue of uh, um, resources, you are indeed right, uh, uh, Doc, as you said. We should have a, 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 a those layers, continental, regional, and national. But an opportunity we have in developing the implementation plan, if we feel that is not sufficient there, let us correct that in having those breakdown in the implementation plan. So it's where we are going to need you because Dr. Roland even told me, uh, say, let us work together because ECOWAS, you are putting more money to implement your own resources. So we can have wow on that to help us to, 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 to break that aspect. And another issue I was raising when I say I need, uh, I need uh, to go offline, the, the, the issue of per diem, that was not happening with Rex because I was trying to raise it. I will give you an example. Where we saw people saying, I will not go to that meeting, there's no per diem. A, a big, a new institution in another region. And then we are saying that person deserves to be fired because we, we are failing our continent. We are 1.3 1 million, a billion. And then you are working for the continent and you are still going through money. You are a rotten orange among uh, those uh, uh, inter, uh, uh, um, inter institutions. So it's why our appeal to our REC, we, we are so grateful to you for being very supportive, being with us here. We need to support the younger one. You can assign a younger man, go to that meeting, cannot tell you, no, my superior, there is nothing. No, 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 no. You have, you have a salary. Go there is your responsibility. You are soldiers for the continent. And thank you, Doc, for raising that aspect. So it was not me trying to flag the wreck. No, far away from me. It was uh, to portray this trend. We have to work as soldiers for our, to die for our continent. And uh, number one, it was uh, it, with regard to uh, the issue of having a manual uh, uh, industry, uh, if we are uh, and we can be we are ready for industrialization. The only way we, we are handling it is through the measurement of science, technology, and innovation. You cannot measure something. You cannot manage something you can never measure. Because there is a day a mother, the daughter fell at the university. And when the mother looked at the school, so how can you fail? You pass everywhere. And when she went to the university, the university has rules. She doesn't know the rule of the university. She's interpreting on her own. So it means that we can only interpret the management of STI if we can be able to manage, to measure STI. So we have some manual, but we need to go through this engagement to panelize, to have dashboard and so forth. And congratulations, as I said to you, Nasetem, as you have it. So we need, we were discussing yesterday with Dr. Zulu, Prof. Ambali was here, all of us, management. Data is important. We need to manage STI. If we don't manage STI, we cannot move ahead. We need to measure apology, STI. Number two, the issue of strong partnership. Indeed, we support that. Uh, I think we need to continue. We are, we are part of the G20, as I told you. We, you have to be very careful in using global, not global stuff now, because we are part of the G20. So meaning we are powerful, we are capable. So we cannot continue crying. So we need to go through partnership, and then they are preaching what we call triangular development cooperation, where three countries around the world can team up together. So I think uh, with those aspects, I covered all my bits. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jacin, I don't know if uh, I ran away from one question. Uh, th thank you.
Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, so addressing your question um, concerning the um, bio specimen. So the specimen are really kept in Wagmik as I speak now. All the 30,000 samples are in Wagmik. We have a dedicated, you know, facility for all the samples. And then is the PI is being led by my director. And most of the works are done here. It's only the gene editing that will be done in Yale University. And he is the main person because he got that grant is over 7 million, whatever, that he's using it for. Them. So he has you no know, ownership of it. Yeah. So we control it. it we just have the partnership, but 99.5% is controlled in Ghana. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I saw a hand, Dr. Fortunate. So this will be the last uh, question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mine is not a question. Okay. It's just a supplement to okay. uh, what Dr. Seke presented. Now, when you look at Rex, how are we implementing this? We have this at the African Union level, now at the continental level. And what East African community did was to go to STISA and because it is very um, not specific, look at specific pillars, actually look at all, this, all the pillars of the STISA and develop specific activities that can be implemented by the national, uh, by our partners in terms of partner states. Because most of the activities that are in CISA are general and re, at the continental level. So we simplify them. We call it, we regionalize the, the continental one and the pattern of states nationalized now the regional uh, uh, CISA. So we developed out of that, we developed what for us what we call ESC, uh, Regional Science and Technology Innovation Policy. Out of the policy, we developed a strategy because it is more it is more uh, directive and guides how to implement these activities. Now, we have our partners who are our focal points, the National Councils of Science and Technology. In each partner state, there is a National Council of Science and Technology. There is a ministry responsible for science and technology. There is a ministry of ICT. And STISA runs across all sectors. As you can see, it is environment, it is health, it is this and that. So we engaged with these sectors during the midterm evaluation of ours, uh, which we did last year, uh, the midterm evaluation of ours, science and technology policy. And we found out that uh, not only this policy is being implemented at the regional level, it is also being implemented at the departmental level of the government ministries, the MDS ministries, departments, and agencies. And uh, what we realized was uh, uh, also the national, the national, the pattern of states also have their national policies on STI coming from our regional from the ESC STI policy. So it trickles down, it trickles from the continental to the regional, to the national, and also to the department. And the sectors are the same. That's the best part of the, of the game. And uh, when they are doing evaluation, actually when they did the determined evaluation of STISA 1, they came, the consultants came to us. So we provided how we have been implementing STISA. And that's the reason why you find that the citizens too, the way it is developed, it is inclusive because those are the comments we gave during the evaluation. So we gave a credit to uh, NEPAD, or the NEPAD for inclusively involving us both in the implementation and also in evaluating how we have developed system. And that's the way to go. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I think he, this is exactly the philosophy that was behind Teaser 2024. Because you see what happened when there was a CPA, the Consolidated Plan of Action, 2005 to 2010. It was supposed to be a five-year strategy. 
which was adopted in Dakar in 2005 by okay, the, the lead minister there was the, uh, the was was the chair of the current chair of APET, Madame Yaya Dia. You see, in the CPA, there were 12 flagship program areas, material science, biodiversity, you know, indigenous knowledge and what have you. And there was an impression plan, or plan, it was a plan as it is. That was a plan for NEPAD and the AUC. So if anything, it was a document that was supposed to do it, you know, kind of like, it was a document that was supposed to be NEPAD and the AUC, yeah, implementing. And that's why when we went to now thinking of the STISA, so the, 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 the successor of CPA, we said, no, who is, who is implementing this? And this, again, this also goes with, beyond, this, beyond this philosophy of trying to say, people are going to put money into, what, into one pocket and you're going to implement science on the continent. It doesn't happen. Countries are already investing in science and technology. It may not be much, but they're already putting money. You see? So, and it's not easy for countries to take money from their countries and put it into a regional or a continental sort of like, uh, you know, fund. You know, we, I mean, it's a pipe dream. We've tried it. So that's why I said, no. Where does the implementation take place? So the implementation takes place at the member state level. In which case, the RECs are the ones that you should now be drawing the, the plan of STISA, just as he has explained there. So STISA, I've not seen the fund funded definition. If it is there to prescribe, that's why I went to say, I don't do a special plan, I said, special plan for STISA. Well, what you can do yourself is just do a coordination plan because your role is one of coordination. You know, the real implementation starts at the right level. This is, this is where people now know now go throughout these things, just like he put it yesterday when he was trying to do that. And then that trickles down to member state, to member state level. So really, that is going to the spirit. And if we, in the second teaser, uh, you know, there's any development from, from that, uh, we may have a challenge. But otherwise, that is exactly the way he has explained it. It will never, the teaser will never define things to the fine detail. Because that is left to the RECs and the member states. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I believe one of the main objective of this dialogue was experience and knowledge sharing. And we've seen that ISTECO is really a step ahead in implementing a, a science, technology, and innovation on the continent. There is so much that we can learn from them. So we could take ISTECO as a, a case study and uh, try and engage with them bilaterally and learn as much as we can and implement this not only at the regional level, but these are some of the uh, is it examples that can be implemented at national level and organizational level as well. So I'm really hoping that we would continue with the discussions over lunch and even as we go back uh, to our various places that we'll continue to dialogue and uh, continue the implementation. It's uh, after one now, so we are going to end uh, the discussion for this session and uh, go for lunch. And when we come back, we have uh, two more presentations and then we'll call it um, a meeting or dialogue. So we'll uh, leave it about 1.15 and we'll come back uh, at 2.15. So I'd like us to really appreciate um, the presenters for this uh, session appreciate the moderator and also appreciate ourselves with a hand clap. <laughs> Thank you very much and bon appetit.